I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look. An empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, ah! fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Hey, I'm gonna hop in the shower. Does somebody wanna come use the bathroom while I'm in here? Oh, wasn't that wonderful? And we are here to say a special thank you to all of you mothers. So the first thing I would like to do is have all of you who are mothers to please stand. Would you? If you've been a mother, you are a mother. Let's show our appreciation to each one of them. All right. Thank you. Now, the rest of you please stand. Because we're going to have our opening song and uh, listen to God's word here uh, as we think about what God has to say to us. Now, remember, we are in about uh, a theme of uh, the church leaves the building and we go out into the world. And those that early church, the apostles and the early Christians, they knew they were getting into persecution, right? They knew that they were getting into trouble uh, just by uh, defying uh, the authorities that were there. And so... One of the uh, promises that it given is it's a, actually a doxology that, that's used by many, but it comes to us from the book of Jude. So let's remember what God promises us uh, through this doxology. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. And so he gives us a promise as we go out into the world that he will be with us and protect us and help us in all the ministries he's asked us to do. And so let's sing together a shelter in the time of storm. Let's sing it together. <clears throat> The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, shelter in the time of storm. Whatever is, He'll be tied, shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock. Shelter in the time of storm. Shade by day, defense by night. A shelter in the time of storm. No fears, alarm, no foes of Christ. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. Shout 
just say good morning in some way there. <clears throat> At least you get to look around and see who's here and uh, have a chance to give them a smile and get one uh, uh, back. Uh, this next little song is a, is a chorus. It, it's easy to learn. If you don't know it, you'll pick it right up. We're going to sing it a couple of times, uh, but it just has to do with how great and mighty our God is. And when you think back to that first church, all the things that God did to get the church started, and then he's continuing on empowering us to be his people uh, even today. So great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Lift your banner. Lift your banner. Then we have another song that is kind of new. Uh, I didn't know it until I came here and David Wood uh, uh, gave it to us. And so it was a, a great song to learn. And I, I'm going to teach it to you this morning. So I'm going to sing the first verse just so you can kind of get in tune with the melody line. But it has great words to it. And we're going to be singing this song twice as well. But he paid a debt. So let's uh, learn this song and sing it and enjoy it together. Great truth that is in it. <clears throat> he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt he could not pay. He treated someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Now you sing the second verse with me. My debt he paid upon the cross. He cleansed my soul from all this wrong. Yeah, I won't let no one could all my sins But now I see a brand new song amazing grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. He didn't give to me alone, he gave himself, now he's my own. He's gone to heaven to make for me a place. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Again, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. My debt he paid on the cross, he cleansed my soul from all his wrong. I thought that no one could all my sins erase, but now I see the brand new song, amazing grace. All 
tells my story, and I know it does many of you, most of you, probably maybe all of you, in fact, uh, that how we feel about the Lord. And, and, you know, the impact that sin has on our life takes a while to wake up to that fact. Uh, you know, I'm not any worse than the person next to me. I'm as good as my neighbor. But you know what? That's not good enough, is it? God, God says, uh, the wages of sin it separates me from you. It separates us together. So we need someone to pay our sin debt. And that's what Jesus did. So we come to worship him this morning. That's what this song allows us to do a little more on a quiet side where we just simply say, you know, like the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Let's sing this precious little chorus together. As the deer, we'll sing it a couple of times. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. again now for the Lord's Supper beneath the cross of Jesus where we all come bow down before him and just be at one with him drink of his water let's sing together uh, a couple of verses uh, beneath the cross of Jesus that is our communion song beneath the cross of Jesus I fain would take Oh, 
Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. All you mothers are going to hear those three little words, and hopefully it's not, what's for dinner? No, you know those three little words, right? I love you. All right. So, it starts pretty early, too, right? You know, you take that baby home from the hospital, and you're holding a baby, you're telling her, I love you. I love you. And you keep saying that over and over for a year or so. And finally, sometime a year or so later, you hear back, oh, and you know that means I love you, right? And so that thrills your heart. You know, those, those babies continue to grow. And at some point, they go off to kindergarten, and, and, and you cry a little bit over the you know, separation anxiety. Uh, but they thrive. They, they, they go off to, to kindergarten. And somewhere between kindergarten and first grade, you know, little girls tend to grow up a little faster than boys. And so they, they got their eye on that little boy, you know, across the room. And he's more to be probably thinking about catching frogs and catching girls, right? So, you know, but, but she, she writes a little note and she sends it to him, you know, and he opens it up and it says, I like you. Do you like me? Check yes or no. <laughs> you know, but things continue to progress, right? Eventually the boys catch up. And, and you know, and they're, they're eyeing each other and, and, and so... One of them gets up the courage, you know, you said the guy. And, and he asks her out on a date. And they go out on a date and, you know, things progress and it, you know, so they go steady, you know, for, and, and, but still, there's that thing between them that they, one of them's afraid to say those three little words, right? Because they want to make sure that the other one will respond. But eventually one of them gets up the courage and says, I love you. And they hear back, I love you too. It continues, right? It goes on. They get engaged, <clears throat> maybe sometime in college, and they get out of college, and, and uh, they get married, right? And then it starts all over again, right? They bring home that little baby. There were three words that were said once in history. They're the greatest words that were ever spoken, and they were spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ on the when he said, it is finished. Those are the three words, the best words that were ever spoken. Because now, we have access to God through what Jesus Christ did for us. We have a home in heaven. As the song that we just sang, he's there making a place for us. And he will come back and take us to be with him. And he said, make sure you do this, this remembrance of what I did for you. And each time you take it, remember what I did when I died for you on the cross. I not only died for you, but I was raised. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in us and will raise us up too to be with him. So we take this and remembrance of what he did for us and we do it every week to remind us of that wonderful sacrifice he made for us. So let's let's thank him for that. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for you. We thank you for the opportunity we have together today to again remember what your son did for us. We thank you. We thank you for being willing to give him up and for his willingness to do it. And Father, we look forward and the taking of this, each time we do, we look forward to his return. Help us to remember through the taking uh, of the uh, fruit of the vine and the bread to remember that his blood was shed on the cross and hung there and his body hung there for us. We ask this in Jesus' name.
morning. As always, we want to take a, a moment before our sermon here to uh, be praying for those in our congregation or uh, those on our prayer list. Um, wanted to make you aware of a few that aren't on your prayer list as we uh, pray today. Um, some of you might know uh, Jessica Henley. She goes to our, our second service. She was uh, in the hospital this week with some investigating some things, just pray for her recovery. Um, mom of a little girl, so I know you know life doesn't slow down very much uh, for uh, people in that life situation, and so just be praying for her. Also keep in mind uh, Glenn and Brenda McGarvey. Um, many of you know them. Both of them had surgery this week, uh, so it's been a busy week for them. Both the surgeries went great, um, but just be praying for their recovery. Uh, and also wanted to let you know, many of you know Ann and Doug Hudnall. Uh, Doug passed away on Friday, uh, went to be with Jesus. And so, um, you know, he's been uh, dealing with health struggles for a while now. And so we're, um, you know, praising uh, God because of his wholeness and peace now, but also just want to be praying for the family that he leaves behind, of course. And so uh, just wanted to make you aware of those and pray for those on our list here as well. Would you please join me as we pray? Father God, we thank you for this morning and this opportunity that we have to come before you and to uh, lift up our prayer requests, lift up the people on our list here that uh, many of them are in need of healing or in need of recovery, in need of surgeries, in need of different things. Uh, and God, we just want to place them before you uh, because we know um, how powerful you are and how merciful and gracious you are to help us in our time of need just pray that you would continue to give strength through your spirit to those uh, on our list dealing with different things, different struggles, um, particularly for uh, the Hudnall family as they're, they're mourning Doug's loss, that, um, that you just uh, give them peace and comfort during this time to uh, rest assured in the promises that we have of the hope uh, that we have in Jesus. Also wanted to take this time today, Lord, to just pray for uh, the mothers in our lives, and God, that... Uh, you know, so many um, sacrifices are made uh, from our moms and the things they do for us and pour into us. And just want to thank you for their presence and their love in our lives. But also we know that Mother's Day can be a difficult day in a lot of ways. Some who have uh, lost their mothers in years gone by or maybe didn't ever have the opportunity to be a mother. And so uh, just pray that in a, in a day of joy and, and celebration, and we also just pray that your comfort would be upon those who, uh, that this might be a little bit of a harder day uh, as well. God, we thank you so much for your love and your grace, and we thank you for Jesus, and it's his name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible this morning, I would love for you to turn to Acts chapter 10. Uh, as we continue this series through the book of Acts, the church has left the building, looking at uh, the mission that we have as the church to go out beyond just what we do on a Sunday morning. Uh, and to go out and into the world and to carry out the mission that we've been given of carrying the name of Jesus uh, to those around us. Last week, we began a, a, conversa a, a conversation about conversion. We looked at this transformation of Saul, the church persecutor, uh, to this church planter that would go by Paul. And we saw that God does amazing things to those whom we least expect sometimes. We saw Saul and saw, you know, if, if anybody was to carry out the mission of the early church of carrying Jesus to the ends of the earth, you'd probably not pick someone who is actively opposed to the work of the church. But God, through his grace, did an amazing thing through this man named Saul. And I want to continue kind of to talk about conversion this morning. This idea of our lives never being the same must change when we come into the presence of Jesus uh, because really, that's kind of what this entire book of Acts is about. But specifically this morning, as we come to Acts chapter 10, it's really a conversion story, not just of one man, but of two. And it's a conversion, in a lot of ways, born out of prejudice. We live in a culture right now where everyone can, I think, identify with prejudice or discrimination or oppression or unfair treatment. It seems to be at the highlight of every news story, the, the highlight of every uh, current event right now. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, regardless of where we might be from, chances are one, one of us in one way or another, or some, many of us in one way or another, one angle or another, might be able to consider ourselves prejudiced, victims of prejudice. Like I said, it's kind of 
a, a fever pitch in our culture right now, but maybe, maybe you feel prejudiced because of your skin color. Maybe you feel prejudiced because of your heritage. Maybe you feel prejudiced because of your political ideologies. Maybe you feel prejudiced because of your religious beliefs. That so many things in our world seek to divide us and seek to cast us as, as opposites of one another. That we can all identify with the unfair treatment that comes at the hands, from the hands of people that are not like us. People that are other. And I think it's in the middle of a culture like this in our world as it is today with this concern or maybe even this fascination with prejudice that we find this story this morning that really speaks in a lot of ways to the church's mission in the midst of a culture like ours. And it all begins in the story of a man named Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. We read of Cornelius, this kind of portrait at first. It says, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Now, there's a classification of many that you will see sometimes in the New Testament or even in the Old a little bit called God-fearers. And what this is, is someone who uh, is following the God of of the Jews or God of Christianity, uh, following God, worshiping God, They went to synagogue, they followed the main practices of Judaism, they prayed, they fasted, they gave to the needy, but they never were considered full converts to Judaism because they were not circumcised. And so this was a a big deal in the Jewish culture that uh, these Gentiles were worshiping God, and so they wanted to allow them to be a part of, uh, of, of that, of worshiping God, but weren't given full communion with him, weren't allowed entrance into the temple, weren't allowed all the benefits that came with Judaism. And it's really hard to appreciate in a man, named like Cornel- a man like Cornelius of what this would have meant for him to be a, a God-fearer. He would have forsaken the gods of his culture, of, of Roman culture, and this would have been all the more impactful knowing that he is a centurion. As a commander of a military unit, it would have been the expectation that he would honor, honor the gods of his culture with sacrifice and, uh, and with, with uh, you know, abandon and, and knowing that Many of these gods were thought to be their benefactors, particularly gods of war, that if they were not honored, then they would become angry, which would certainly result with defeat and battle. And so I'm sure in a lot of ways, Cornelius felt prejudice from those who did not consider him you know, in full communion with God, but also from the other end of the spectrum in his culture, as one who is outsider because of whom he worshiped. But Cornelius has turned away from these false gods of his culture, and God has recognized Cornelius' love and allegiance. And so one day when he is praying, Cornelius is visited from a a messenger from God in a vision. Verse 3, it says, One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. So this is exactly what Cornelius does. He sends two servants and a soldier to find this Peter. And it's here as we encounter Peter once again that this is why I've called this kind of a conversion of two men. Because in this story, we we find Peter... Uh, in addition to Cornelius, and, and we find Peter in, in kind of the way we used to see him in the Gospels. And so, so much of the book of Acts so far, Peter has become you know, a prominent apostle and a key leader in the church, but every now and then we get these glimpses of the Peter that we know and love uh, from the Gospels, the one that often lacks the filter or, or you know, kind of uh, goes against what God wants of, of him at first. As we read of Peter's side of the story in verse 9, it says, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds, and a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now, I know that, you know, on this side of the gospel, it's easy sometimes to make fun uh, of Peter. But actually, in this moment, it's to his credit that he has not uh, eaten unclean animals in his life. Peter's reaction and his confusion show, in a lot of ways, his devotion to God and, and following the law that God had given. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 11, God had expressly forbidden Israel to eat certain types of animals. The land animals that they, had, they, they were allowed to eat had to chew the cud and have a split hoof. And so sea creatures had to have fins and scales. So no pigs, no camels, no rabbits, all of these things were forbidden for them to eat. Now in this moment, Peter is being told that all of these things are free game. You know, the buffet is open. The, the fact that God is lowering this tablecloth full of all of these animals and saying, you know, eat whatever you want is beyond Peter's scope of understanding. And in many ways to him, it's probably even horrifying. There are times in history when Jewish people had given their lives rather than eat unclean food, and now Peter is being told to go against that. It'd be like your parents dumping out this bucket of Halloween candy on the kitchen table and saying, you know, eat up, dig in, it's, it's, it, have your fill, have whatever you want. You know, you, as a kid, you think that's, that's not how this works, you know? But God is doing something here that includes more than just food. God is lifting a distinction, lifting a barrier that has kept Jews and Gentiles separate. And that anything he declares clean should not be called dirty or impure or unworthy. And that's right about when these three ambassadors from Cornelius' house arrive. Are you seeing the connection? You see, what we see playing out between these two men, like I said, is really a double conversion. For Cornelius, he is about to be transformed by the grace of God, that he too and people like him can be a part of the kingdom. And as we look at a chapter like this, usually the focus is on him. But we also see Peter also being transformed by the grace of God, but in a different way, and coming to learn that the kingdom includes people that are not like him people that are, are not like him. And I think it's this lesson that Peter learns that can be a greater impact to us as the church that needs to leave the building. You see, Peter is learning a lesson that has been growing and gaining momentum throughout the book of Acts. And I think it's this lesson that each of us need to learn, that Jesus calls us to reach people on our worldwide mission, even when it means that, it is, that we are reaching people that are not like us. That Jesus calls us to reach people that are not like us. And as we talk about this mission this morning, I want to develop it in one sentence formed by three parts. And the first is this, that we have a worldwide mission. If you've been paying attention through our series so far and following in the book of Acts, then we know this is not a surprise. We know that the ultimate goal of this Jesus movement throughout the book of Acts is to reach the ends of the earth, is to go worldwide. Jesus tells us this in the very beginning of the book in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He, like I said, he kind of gave us this table of contents that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. That we see the kingdom expanding you know, greater and greater, further and further through the work of the early church. But though many understand the, the premise, though we may understand the premise of understanding and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, Something strange happens when we picture what that worldwide mission looks like. Because I think in a lot of ways, when we picture reaching the ends of the earth with the gospel, the ends of the earth look a lot like our own backyard. And we picture a world that looks just like us, acts like us, has the same worldview as us. And this is exactly where Peter is this morning. He has heard from Jesus himself that, that we are to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, that our mission does not contain just a small area, but explodes all over the place. But up to this point, it's been really a, a kind of understated in, in the minds of the church that it, as long as it's part of the world that looks and acts and feels like they do. You know, for Peter, it's bring the gospel to all the Jews to the ends of the earth. And Peter had to learn this lesson that God had been trying to teach all along. God had set Israel, the Jewish nation, apart from the very beginning because of the depravity around them. Now, the, the Jewish nation was to be a holy nation, was to be set apart, out of which 
he would call his son. God had been trying to set apart these people from the very beginning, but for a purpose of reaching those who were not like them. Genesis 12, 3, when this promise is made to Abraham uh, of this great nation, he says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In Isaiah 49, 6, he says, I will make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And the tragedy of all of this, though, is that Israel twisted this incredible gift, this, this promise, into self-appointed favoritism. And I think, unfortunately, that same kind of attitude and thinking can creep into the church, that we're better because of the building that we have, or the numbers that we have, or the religious purity that we have, that God must think that we're really something. And so never forget that we have a worldwide mission and that every gift that God has ever given us is meant for us to see in service to others. That every gift that God has given us is, is for the means of reaching others for Him. And the minute that we forget that is the minute that we stop being a church and just become a social club that really likes to sing. So we have a worldwide mission, but this mission, the second part of the sentence, this mission is often hindered by walls. In 1961, communist East Germany constructed the Berlin Wall to prevent movement from its citizens into democratic Western Germany. And believing that the freedom of democracy over the ideologies of communism, in 1987, Ronald Reagan traveled to Berlin and delivered these words in a speech. He said, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You see, if we are to complete our worldwide mission, we have to accept the challenge to, dare to, to tear down the walls that separate us from reaching lost and unsaved people. That is the challenge of Acts chapter 10. Here, while Peter is left wondering about the contents of this vision and what it means to kill and eat all of these unclean animals, men from Cornelius' home arrive. And after the 30-mile walk to Caesarea, Peter finds himself in a very different place as a Jew on the threshold of a Gentile home. One that for his entire life he had been forbidden to cross over. Verse 24 says, The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. And I don't think it can be overstated what these next words mean. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Now, I think it's important to note, as Peter says it is against the law for him to associate with a Gentile, this is not God's law, but the tradition law of laws around him. The, the oral laws that have been created to help keep holiness and separation. These laws that had hindered Jews from associating with Gentiles were traditions that were set in place by the religious leaders. They were things that Jesus so often spoke against. But for the Jews, there was this idea that Gentiles were host to this dangerous and incurable disease, maybe even a pandemic, if you will, that went by the horrifying name of cooties. You know cooties when you are uh, little, that, that you know, there are, there are cooties around you, things that people have that uh, you can't be a part of. And this kind of pervaded into these traditions, into these laws around them. Things like if a speck of dust, if a, if a flake of dandruff fell off a Gentile and landed on something, that was enough to make that item unclean. If a Gentile was left alone in a room by himself, that everything in that room was unclean, there was no telling what he might have touched and defiled with his cooties. If you bought a knife from a Gentile, you would have had to grind it down completely and resharpen it to, to rid it of anything that might have caused it to be unclean. And these kinds of things sound ridiculous to us. I mean, who would go through all of these great lengths just to, to avoid and alienate people? But on the same hand, I think we have 
walls of our own sometimes, walls of prejudice that you can associate with us if you're a certain color, a certain sexuality, or a certain social status, walls of preference, that you can worship with us if you dress in a certain way or, or sing the right church songs, walls of protection, that you can be a part of us if you can prove that you're not a, a threat to our comfort bubble. But these walls and others like them need to be torn down in the light of the story of Peter and Cornelius, in the light of the call of the gospel. And that's where our third part of the sentence comes in. That we have a worldwide mission, and while the mission is often hindered by walls, we tear down these walls to the gospel. That we have this worldwide mission. And while this mission is often hindered by walls, we must tear down those walls, and we do so through the power of the gospel. Peter speaks this gospel message to Cornelius and his family in verse 34. It says, Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message that God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the, the people and testify that he is the one whom God appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them a few more days. When it comes to what tears down these walls, what separates us from others, I think it's important to note that Peter doesn't launch in into a, a diatribe on politics. He doesn't begin a, a lecture on critical race theory. He doesn't begin to talk about different social programs that might unite the races. No, he goes to the gospel. You see, it is through the gospel that we have hope. It is through the gospel that the walls are torn down. It is through the gospel that we are saved. It's not through following the right religious rules or instituting the right social programs or, or, or having the, the right politicians in place. It is by following the God of all people who sent his son to die for all people. Cornelius had followed all the right religious, religious practices. He had prayed, he had fasted, he had, he had given to the needy, but still God said to him, you're missing something. And in the same way, if our faith is performance-focused more than it is Jesus-focused, then we will always come up short. And isn't it fitting that, you know, through the right it isn't through fitting the right mold that we are saved. It isn't right by doing the, the right things that we are saved. The lesson that comes bursting forth from this story is that there isn't one cookie-cutter kind of Christian, and that our salvation isn't dependent on looking the part or acting the part or belonging to the right class of people or, or national identity. Our, our salvation is dependent upon hearing the message of God's good news, of Christ's death and resurrection and accepting his payment in our place. You see, the gospel is real and available to all races and classes and conditions of humanity, exalts the humble and humbles the exalted by proclaiming the message that God brings peace through his Son. And I think, I think that changes how we look at this mission that we've been given. As we seek to leave these walls, 
We begin by the relationships that we have, talking with the people that we know, but there's also people that we need to reach out to, people that are not like us, people that don't fit the mold, people that might look out of place if they were to show up this morning. But what better people to reach for the gospel? And I have a story real quick as we close of what that looks like in action. In his book, The Kingdom of God is a Party, uh, Tony Campolo relates this story about an experience that he had in a diner in Hawaii. He was up at 3 a.m. because of the time difference and the jet lag on his trip. And so Tony finds himself seated on the stool of a greasy spoon diner, uh, about, uh, which is about the only thing open at 3 a.m. And he sits at the counter. A, a big guy behind the counter comes over and you know, gruffly asks, what do you want? Uh, well, he's not so hungry anymore after looking at his surroundings. And so Tony just settles on, I'll, I'll have a donut and a coffee. And as he sits there munching on his donut and sipping his coffee at 3.30 in the morning, in walk eight or nine prostitutes, provocative, loud prostitutes who had just finished their night's work. They plop down at the counter, and Tony finds himself uncomfortably surrounded by this group of smoking, swearing hookers. He gulps his coffee, and, and he's planning to make a quick getaway. When he overhears the conversation, the woman next to him says to her friend, You know what? Tomorrow is my birthday. I'm going to be 39. To which her friend nastily replies, so What do you want from me? A, a birthday party, huh? You want me to get a cake? You, you want me to sing happy birthday to you? The first woman says, wait, wait, why, do you to, why do you have to be so mean? You know, why do you have to put me down? I'm just saying it's my birthday. I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should I have a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party my whole life. Why, why should I have one now? Well, when Tony Campolo heard that, he made a decision. He sat and he waited until the woman left, and then he asked the big guy behind the counter, do they come in here every night? Yeah, he answered. Well, the one right next to me, he, he said, she comes in here every night. Yeah, he said, that's Agnes. She's here every night. She's been coming here for years. Why do you want to know? Well, she just said tomorrow is her birthday. And I was thinking, what do you think? Do you, do you think that we, maybe we could throw her a little birthday party for her right here in the diner? Well, a little smile crept over the big guy's chubby cheeks, and he said, that's, that's great. Yeah, that's great. I like it. And he turns to his kitchen, and he shouts out to his wife, hey, come on out here. This guy, he's got a great idea. Tomorrow is Agnes's birthday, and, and he wants to throw a party for her. The wife comes out, yeah, that's terrific, she says. You know, Agnes, she's really nice. She's always trying to help other people, and, and nobody ever does anything nice for her. And so they make their plans. Tony says he'll be back at 2.30 in the next morning with some decorations, and the man whose name turns out to be Harry decides he'll make a cake. And so at 2.30 the next morning, Tony's back, and he has crepe paper and decorations and a sign made of big pieces of cardboard that say, Happy Birthday, Agnes, and they decorate the place from one end to the other, and they get it just looking great for a greasy spoon diner. Well, Harry had gotten the word out to uh, the streets, and about the party, and by 3.15, it seems like every prostitute in Honolulu is in the place. Well, at 3.30 on the dot, the door swings open, and in walks Agnes and her friend. Tony has everybody ready. They all sh shout, happy birthday, Agnes, and Agnes is absolutely stunned. Her mouth falls open, her knees go weak, and she almost falls over. And when the birthday cake with all the candles is brought out, that's when she totally loses it. She's sobbing and crying and Harry, who's not really used to seeing a prostitute cry, gruffly mumbles, well, you know, blow out the cake, you know, the candles, Agnes, you know, cut the cake. Well, she pulls herself together and blows them out. And everyone cheers and yells, and, cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. And Agnes just looks down at the cake, and without taking her eyes off it, slowly and softly she says, you know, Harry, is it, is it all right with you? I mean, if I don't, I, what I want to ask, is it okay if I keep the cake a little while? If we don't, don't just eat it right away. Harry doesn't know what to do, so he just shrugs and says, sure, you know, if that's what you want to do, keep, keep the cake. You take it home if you want. Oh, could I? Agnes asks. Looking at Tony, she, she says, I, I live just a couple streets away. Uh, I want to take the cake home. Is that okay? I'll be right back, I promise. And so she gets off her stool and she picks up the cake and she carries it high in front of her like it's the, the Holy Grail. And everybody watches in stunned silence, and when the door closes behind her, nobody really seems to know what to do. They all look at each other, and they eventually all look to Tony, and 
So Tony gets up on a chair and he says, what do you say that we pray together? And there they are in a hole in the wall, greasy spoon diner with half the prostitutes in Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning listening to Tony Campola as he prays for Agnes and for her life and for her health and for her salvation. Tony recalls, I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When he's finished, Harry leans over and with almost a trace of hostility in his voice says to Tony, hey, you never told me you was a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to anyway? And in one of those moments, just the right words come, Tony answers him, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. Harry thinks for a moment and reflects, and then almost in a mocking voice, he says, no, you don't. There ain't no church like that. Because if there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. What kind of church will we be? Will we be a church that creates barriers to the gospel or tears them down? Will we be a church that reaches out past our prejudices and preferences to deliver, to deliver the gospel to lost and hurting people? Will we be a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes? This morning, that's not a question that we can answer right now, at least I hope we don't, because it's a question that requires reflection. It's a question that requires action. And so for maybe for you, the action to take is maybe you're in a situation like Cornelius. Maybe you've kind of been dabbling on the outsides of the church. You've been hearing sermons and singing the songs and coming for a while, but you've never given your life over to Jesus. Or maybe you're like Peter, and you maybe need a change in your lenses. I know growing up in church my whole life, it's easy to get used to a certain kind of church person and to get comfortable with that and to... to, to be wary of that being threatened. But if we are to be the church that we are called to be, if we are to be a church that leaves the building, that requires a change in us, that no one is beyond the scope of the grace of Jesus Christ. No one is undeserving of hearing the life-changing, life-saving message of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so if you have a decision to make this morning, we'd love to talk, uh, pray with you this morning. I'll be up front I'd love to talk with you, have that conversation with you. But regardless of what decision you make this morning, I hope that all of us will recognize the need that is in the world around us, the need in the people that we look at and think, they're not church people. Because there's nothing greater than seeing people who are unlike us come to receive the grace that we have received. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. And we see the story of, of Cornelius, and it's such a wonderful story of seeing your kingdom expand to this next level of, of not just being contained among this group of, of people that had followed you and, and loved you, but people that were unlike them. To see your kingdom expand to people that don't look the part, don't fit the mold of what we think Christian should look like. But God, in this we see something amazing. We see the work of Jesus doing what it was always intended to do. But so much of his time on this world, Jesus' limited time here, his ministry here, he spent it with sinners and prostitutes. People that, the, uh, uh, that religious people looked at and said, get away from them. Keep them at arm's length. They have no part of this. But Jesus, your love shows that they have every part of this. And that it is our job as your church to carry on the mission that you began to go out and to find people that are not like us so they can experience the same grace and love that we've been shown. God, I pray that you would convict our hearts and that you would empower us through your spirit to have the eyes to see people that are not like us so that we might show them the grace of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that we have been entrusted with this mission. 
what a privilege it is, what a responsibility it is to go out into our world, to tear down walls to the gospel in a world right now that is so divided, so at odds with each other, that we have the cure, we have the hope, we have the answer, and that's Jesus. Let us bring him to the ends of our own world. Let us bring him into our own backyards and to those who are far from him so that everyone might have the opportunity to know who he is and the hope that we have in him. We pray this in his name this morning. Amen. If there's a decision on your heart, you come as we stand together and as we sing, Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. I in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when have a seat. Uh, we have a few quick announcements that I just want to make sure we share with you. Uh, first off, we announced a few weeks back that Theos, uh, they help each other spiritually, that that ladies Bible study that meets on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. was going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus. Well, I'm happy to tell you it is now returning on June the 2nd. Uh, the ladies are going to be starting a new Bible study uh, from a book titled The Women of the Bible Speak. So if you are interested in attending, if you have been or if you want to get started, please uh, see Kay Eaton. There she is over there. Uh, so Kate can get you all the information, make sure that you have the reading material before that class uh, picks back up. Uh, I also want to remind you, any children or grandchildren that are attending summer camp this year, uh, the final payments for summer camps were due last Sunday. Uh, if we did not get together and collect those final payments, please make sure that you see me uh, as soon as possible. And again, I want to reiterate that our registration for Vacation Bible School has opened as well. Uh, if you uh, just go to our website, slcc.church, you'll see a link right at the top of our page. It says VBS 2021. You can register students there, or obviously you can see myself or see Samantha, our children's director, and we can help you out with that as well. Um, Bill, would you mind closing us in prayer today? Well, first of all, we have to. <laughs> this guy right here is really the, the power behind getting this up and, and in place. So let's tell him thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Isn't that, isn't that, that tells the story. It's the lamppost. And uh, also the, this idea is going to carry on because our new uh, building out there that you see when you drive in here is also going to be titled the lamppost. So we're going to have a name for that building and it will primarily be an adult building and the kids will be in the building it's between the two buildings. You can't see from here. But uh, anyway, let's remember, we are the light of the world. Let's stand together and let us sing uh, our song. I'll lead us in a prayer, and then we're going to sing the chorus uh, uh, to a shelter in the time of storm. All right? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for loving us uh, in spite of how um, thoughtless we are and selfish we are and greedy we are and just so... Uh, far away from you in, in our indifference, and then yet you reach out to us in uh, millions of ways and help us to find you. Thank you, Father, for doing that and for helping us to have a life that pleases you and is an enriched life for us. Thank you now for this day and the message behind uh, Cornelius and all and Peter uh, that Bryce brought to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 
Oh, Jesus is the rock in the wind. Adjusting and getting this printed out for me to save me.